Tsunami. Nah. It's not tsunami. <laughs> tsunami. <laughs> She's a goat tsunami. Welcome to Midsummer Maniacs, Maniacs. Hey, hey Maniacs. <laughs> I'm Sarah. And I'm Mark. And today we are on episode five, which is the final episode of season one of Midsummer Murder. First season comes to an end with death in disguise. Dun, dun, dun. There's no disguise. Yeah, if you change your name, that's not really a disguise. No, but there is death. There is right death, off the bat. Right off the bat. Two minutes and 30 seconds in, death. Right away. <laughs> uh, before we get into this, just a reminder, if you let your kids watch the show, they'll be able to listen to the podcast. But if the show is too much for them, the podcast probably is also. I mess up sometimes, and Mark's pretty good at editing me. <laughs> just every once in a while, it slips. <laughs> Also, uh, we're recording this on the day that episode two uh, goes public, and we just want to thank everybody again for all the nice things you've said. You guys are really phenomenal. It's super exciting to see that uh, so many people are listening, and that's all we really ever wanted. We just felt like we were the only two people in the universe who love this show, and it's just so fun to see your comments and your responses and know that we're not the only maniacs out there. Absolutely. Everybody all across the globe, and especially the people on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and Twitter have been fantastic. Yep. Keep it coming. We love to see your comments. You guys have such good interpretations and ideas and answers to crazy questions, and it's great. We're doing it all together. Thank you very much. And now on to Death in Disguise, which was filmed. Now... I got this from Wikipedia, okay. and we have a problem with this. Okay. It says it was filmed in November and December of 1997. It must have been the warmest November and December on record because it does not look like November and December. I will give production designers all kinds of credit. I know that they make it look like it's snowing when it's not. I know they can do amazing things, but it is so clearly summer at this house the hollyhocks are in bloom which you know granted they could be silk they could be in pots we don't know but the trees are in full leaf there's moss everywhere it's just so not december even in england i have to think that wikipedia is wrong i think so too we may have to look up some other sources on that and the show was broadcast on the 6th of may 1998 which is a further two weeks after the first the second two episodes so there was two episodes that were week one week after another and then there was two weeks in the third episode and then another two weeks in the fourth episode there must have been soccer or cricket on or something <laughs> something british that was getting in the way <laughs> And this is uh, Carolyn Graham's third book that was released in uh, 1989, third book in the Barnaby series. Mm -hmm. But the fifth show... If you count the pilot. If you count the pilot and directed again by Baz Taylor and Douglas uh, Watkinson wrote it again, the same team that did the last episode, which is Faithful Unto Death. Mm -hmm. All set in one place, the Lodge of the Golden Wind Horse. Which I have to assume is in Coston. Near Coston. It has to be. They have the worst logo ever. It, like half the words are upside down. It's, it's not good. It's not good. <laughs> and like you have to turn your head all the way around to read all of the words. <laughs> and everybody says wind horse different. We have like golden wind horse or wind horse or wind horse. I'm surprised somebody didn't say wind horse. They could have said wind horse. Uh, there's no aptly named pub in this episode. In the background of one of the shots, we see a pub called The Crown, which we'll talk about when we get to locations. But that's basically it for the major parts that we usually see. Um, this was filmed all over England, uh, including... Is it one of those where the exteriors and interiors were shot in different places? No, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, uh, it's filmed in Amersham, and uh, the other place it's filmed in is... You can hear Mark flipping through his Midsummer Locations book. Uh, Cuttington. That's where the Crown Public House was. 
And finally, the major location was in this place that has the best name ever, which is Nether Winchendundun. Winchendundun. Nether Winchendun. Nether Winchendun. And this is at Nether Winchendun House. Okay. <laughs> Just makes me think of Nether Regions. <laughs> Winchendon. What what does nether mean? N e t h e r. It's not upper or lower. No, it's not big or little. It's nether. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe somebody from the area might fill it, us in. In the nether region house. Yes. We learn pretty quickly that the lodge of the Golden Wind Horse has been in place in this house for ten years. Founded by Bill Carter and Ian Craigie. Two old crooks. Yeah, they're old crooks. They've gone in on it together. Uh, Bill wants out. But, but there's a change with Ian. Ian is now drank the Kool-Aid. He's the master. Wait yeah. a minute. Okay. First of all, Flavor Aid. Yes. If you're talking about he, Jonestown. Yes, he, 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 yes. Get it right. He not only drinks the Flavor Aid, he invented the Flavor Aid. He made it up and he, then drank it. Yep. He made all this up and now fully believes it. Absolutely. But Bill wants out. He wants Ian to like buy him out and they fight about it. And then, oops, Bill falls down the stairs, breaks his neck. He's our first death. Right away. Two minutes and 30 seconds in. So then Arno is at the bottom of the stairs. Mm -hmm. Arno is one of the, are we going to call them? It's not really a cult. I'm not going to say it's a cult. What do you mean? Well, then they're not super culty. They aren't. It's more commune. But they have like ceremonies and they all wear the clothing, the roby things, and they do the stuff under the he, tree. He calls them travelers. Let's call them travelers. That's just what they call members of the cult. <laughs> <laughs> you can call it a commune if you want. I'm going to call it a cult. So Arno is one of the cult members. Arno and he, Gibbs. And he finds the body at the bottom of the stairs. Yes. And then we go to... Can I tell you something about Arno? Yes. Arno Gibbs, played by Charles K. I have uh, an interesting fact about him. Well, he's in Another Midsummer. He's in Vixen's, Vixen's Run in yes. 2006. And he's in A Jonathan Creek and A Frost. And he's probably in The Bill, too. We don't even mention The Bill because everybody in England... And yet they don't play it here. I, even people I desperately who want are to see actors them. have been in The Bill. Yes. But anyway... Here's an interesting little fact for you. He was in Amadeus, the movie version of Amadeus. Oh. And he played Orsini Rosenberg. Okay. Who in Death of a Hollow Man, the midsummer that references Amadeus. Yeah. You remember the guy in the dressing room who tells Nico that he has to go outside because he's mentioned the Scottish play? Yes. That's Orsini Rosenberg. Ah, Okay. So that's the character that he played in the movie. Excellent. They played the same character. Excellent. Anyway, there's your little factoid. Okay. <laughs> so Arno finds Bill at the bottom of the stairs. And looks up at the running. top of the stairs and sees... Ian. Ian, the master. The master standing there. The master of a cult. Yes. <laughs> then we are introduced to Mae Cuddle, who may be my favorite person in this episode. I didn't like her at first. But now I've learned to love her. She, yeah, if you, if you see her through Barnaby's eyes, she's this annoying busybody who makes him crazy. But if you, you take her at her face value in the episode, she's great. In this episode, she doesn't gossip. She plays cello and she helps Barnaby. And she only goes to Barnaby when there's a death. Actually a death. She's played by Judy Cornwell, which uh, all the Anglophiles out there will recognize as she was a great character in Keeping Up Appearances. She was Hyacinth Bouquet's sister. Ah. And she was awesome. <laughs> she was also in a Doctor Who in, in 87. Well, she was like in four episodes of Doctor Who yes. back in 87. She's a well-established actress. And if you see photos of her when she was young, she was gorgeous. I don't doubt it. And actually plays the cello. I'm pretty sure she actually plays yeah, the cello. Yeah, I, th I think she does too. And she and um, the actor who play Arno were both in this show called Supernatural. Mm. Not that not Supernatural. The, not the North American Supernatural. Another it was back in the 70s. Oh. So they probably met Why have we not watched then. that show? I don't know. Because it's on video and we can't stand oh, probably. what video looks like. Anyway. May jumps in the car 
And the important thing about the car here is... It's fantastic. It is fantastic. It's a Morris Traveler. I love it's that car. That, the car is beautiful. It's got the wood on the back. Yep. And it can take bees in hives. <laughs> Later. She drives like a maniac through town and goes to Barnaby's house. The important thing about Barnaby's house is he's cutting the skeleton out of a fish. He's deboning a fish. Do you think he caught that fish? I believe he caught that fish. I think that's what we're supposed to think, is that he caught that fish. And Joyce is making a sauce, but... It's lumpy. But okay. She says it sort of tastes okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he hides from me. He's got a knife and a fish skeleton. <laughs> he has the trash open. And he could drop the fish skeleton in there, but it's not going to be as funny no. when May when he, finds it. Because Cully and Joyce are like, we'll stop you from May. Oh, Joyce says, I'll take care of it. Because she's had assertion training. I'll get rid of her. And then her 240-pound assertion training Plus VAT. <laughs> because May just plows right through the just door. Just right through them. <laughs> she has the most fantastic coordinating outfits, too. Her hat band, her shirt, and her skirt are all made from the very same oh, fabric. We are going to get on to outfits in this episode. <laughs> She says somebody's died at, at the lodge and Barnaby has to go. So He's got to go check it out. They're off to the lodge and Barnaby finds the cops already there. Troy is already there. Troy in a white shirt and white pants. I'm not really sure what's up with that. Maybe he was playing cricket. Maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. They find the dead body. Buller makes a couple of jokes. We meet the other people in the cult, including the beavers. Well, we meet Trixie Channing. Trixie Channing, who is the least culty of the cult members. She really is. And I'm not we, even sure why she's there. She likes the master a lot. I guess. But you never see her wearing the getup. No, she's never in the getup. Oh, she might be when during the regression. Just that one time she yeah, has the robe on. She might have the robe on that And we time. meet Suhami. Suhami, who is pretty. Well, okay. And they even say in the episode that her name means beautiful. Which it doesn't. I looked this up. If somebody speaks Hindi and knows better, please let us know. But from my Googling powers, Suhami with an M as in mama is not a name. It's Suhani. And that means beautiful. And sure. actually now in London, it's kind of slang for hot tamale baby cakes. So like boo. She's my Suhami. Honey. Suhani. Suhani. Yeah. Suhani. Oh, are you my Suhani? Yeah, baby. Okay. So we meet Trixie and Suhani. And the beavers, the beavers, the beavers. Which we got to talk about next. And Tim, Tim, <laughs> which I always want to say, <laughs> like they say it in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Tim, like Tim always has to be a question in my head. <laughs> so Tim's on the roof mm -hmm. and the beavers are in the foyer. Yes. With... <laughs> necklaces on their heads the star and the eye which ian wears too but he wears around his neck like he wears a normal around person his neck like a normal person <laughs> so but the best part of about the beavers is their matching outfits every single outfit in the episode they're matching so i've got some stuff on the beavers okay okay so ken beaver is played by colin farrell oh not that colin not farrell, that colin farrell. <laughs> a different colin farrell which, you know, you have to feel sorry for the actor because no matter, how, you know, what kind of career he's had, Google hates him now. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, like he can't, he can't get a uh, hit on the internet for love nor money. And then uh, his wife, Heather Beavers, is played by Diane Bull. This is a sad fact. So this episode aired in May of 98. Yep. She died in December of 98. Oh, she that's was only 46. That's horrible. So she had cancer while they were filming this episode. Very young. That's sad because she's, they're great. Oh, she's great. But once again, the books have little bits that are even better. How are the beavers so, in the books? So we'll talk about the background of the beavers and the, the, the secrets of the beavers, but they're obviously very into this cult, right? They are all in. They both live there. They wear their matching outfits. They've got their necklaces on their heads. They're all in. They're helping Bill pass over. In the book, Guy, Suhani's dad, 
Got when it. he comes to the commune cult for the first time and is kind of looking around, he picks up a book written by Kenneth Beavers. Okay. And if I gave you a million guesses, <laughs> you would not guess the name of this book. No idea. Are you ready? It's called The Romance of the Enema. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they take that part out? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it was on Bill's bookshelf and Barnaby's in there and we just don't notice. The only book I noticed in Bill's in Bill's room is a book about Cleopatra. Yeah. But yeah, Ken. The Romance of, of the, the Enema. enema. <laughs> well. Just, when I saw that, I was like, that's too fantastic. <laughs> and I can't, well, I don't want to even imagine what it's about. <laughs> it's just bad. And it makes you think of that acorn tea completely differently. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed it does. The plant killing acorn tea. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> so they're helping Bill pass over, in which Troy gets snarky right away and asks, it, has it helped? Yeah. And they answer him like he's completely serious. Yeah, because they're completely serious. Bullard says that the guy who fell down the stairs may have been drinking and may just freaks out. Yeah. He was never a drinker. He never drank. And we're introduced to, to Tim by Craigie. Mm-hmm. Tim, who's... How old do you think Tim is? He's got a little bit of a wispy mustache. I'd say 17. Yeah. That is 17 written all At over At the him. most. Yeah. Maybe 16. He's certainly not an adult. No. But he is problematic, and we'll get there. And he, he's mute. He doesn't speak. He hasn't spoken since he got there, which has been, what, 18 months, they say? Like a year. Yeah. He said a, like year a year ago. Yeah. So off they go, Troy and Barnaby. And as they're leaving, Troy's driving takes new heights. Oh, my gosh. The straw. The hay. The hay actually comes into the car. In the moonroof. <laughs> and out of the back of the truck where the hay was comes Christopher Wainwright. Yes, who is much better known as Bill from True Blood. Yeah, played by Stephen Moyer. Now, there's a, a weird line just after that where Troy says, Shirley just calls to Newcastle. No, no, that's not a weird line. The weird line is later. But what does that mean? It means that you take coals to Newcastle when they already have all the coal. Coals to Newcastle. Yes. Okay, I wrote down calls to Newcastle. No, no, no. The subtitling so let me the down. The idiom means that why on earth would Joyce need assertion training? Gotcha. She's already assertive enough. And Barnaby says, if only it had been cooking. Yeah. <laughs> he talks about Craigie being a good man. And then the, the line that we've gotten wrong, which I'm very hard to figure out with this line. Troy says, praise, love, and grow your own goat. That's what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. But it's praise, love, and grow your own goods, according to the subtitle. Okay. I remember us saying praise, love, and grow your own goat to each other. <laughs> You and me? Yes. Oh, I thought you were going to say it was some kind of Anglican thing. No, <laughs> I thought for a long time it was goat, but there it's are, goods. There are goats in this episode. Yes, it is a goat-filled episode. Including a runaway goat. The runaway goat. Then we have a time leap. The days in these episodes, again, are all screwed up. So we can only assume that Bill's death has been declared an accident. Barnaby and Troy have moved on because the next time we hear about Bill, it's because the cult members are all out under the tree scattering his ashes and Barnaby and Troy are there to observe the funeral to be, res well, Barnaby's being respectful. Anyway. Yes. But Barnaby picks up Cully at the bus because she's up in Perth, Scotland. Mm -mm. Trying out for Trying a Trying out for a Macbeth role. One of the witches. And that's where we see the Crown Pub. Yes. And then he invites her to, he says, let's go for coffee. And then he goes, well, I'm going to a funeral. You want to come with me? And then he just stitches her. Well, I guess she Troy. said no. I guess she said no. So I got I got something about the funeral, though. Oh, there's <laughs> lots of the funeral. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how much of what they say at the funeral, because Heather kind of does all the talking at the funeral, how much of it was mumbo jumbo invented, invented for the Lodge of the Golden Wind Horse? Scourge of the negative order. Yes. And how much of it was like references to other kind of new agey things? So she says that Bill will be a Chohan of the first ray. Yeah, which to me, the first thing that reminded me of was Father Brown and that weird cult that's in father brown that's all around the sun with the sun yeah but cho 
Johan of the First Ray is a thing. Please do tell. There's this whole kind of, I don't want to say it's weird, because if you believe, then that's fine. But there's this kind of conglomeration of of religions where like Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and all of the like major deities are all lifted up to be the seven rays. Oh. But now there are 12. Oh. Because it has recently been revealed. And by recently, I mean within the last five years that there are five additional rays, but they're secret. It's a shame about Ray. I fell down a rabbit hole of strangeness <laughs> looking this up. I can only say I'm glad I work somewhere where they don't watch our search history because between the poisons and the psychotic medications and the cho hands of the first ray that I've been Googling. My coworkers so who would is wonder the about first me. Ray? They're not ranked like that. Okay. It's like they're all kind of equal. Okay. Boy, you just give it a Google. There's some amazing gifts out there for these websites. Well, luckily, May could check in with Bill because she's been talking to Bill. That's right. His, and, his spirit has was kind of lingering around, right? And we get a little more information about Chris Rainwright. He's a BBC cameraman who was in Rwanda. Bad news. He's been traumatized. He's been traumatized. <laughs> so he needs some time. Now, this is an ITV show, and this is the second BBC reference. Yeah, and kind of negative because Agnes... And and Death of a Hollow Man she worked was for a, the BBC. Worked for the BBC. And now Chris, who is death in disguise, dun, dun, dun. is not actually a BBC cameraman. Right. Then we get the big storm. Well, Trixie and Ken and Heather are coming back from getting the bees. We don't know where the bees came from. Well, I know why Trixie went, because she got some bonking while she was out <laughs> away from the commune. Some blue envelope bonking? Some blue envelope bonking. So they're moving the bees and being absolutely ridiculous about it. And Trix, Trixie, the beavers won't let them go more than 30 miles an hour. And then Trixie says that she should sing to the bees. Yes, because they get a flat tire and Ken's changing it. And Trixie For, does kind of seem to get a laugh. Yeah. And then there's a the big storm. They get to back to the manor and the master gets out of bed and just freaks out about where Tim is. Where is Tim? And everybody freaks out where everybody, Tim is. Everybody, where is Tim? There's no clear indication that they don't know where Tim is. Like, they don't, like, huh, oh, Tim, are you in your room? No, no, they just go right to freak out. They immediately assume Tim's outside, even though Tim is terrified of storms. Later, we we hear that he's terrified of storms. So as soon as there's a storm, he's going to hide, right? But in then, a closet, which makes perfect sense. That's a perfectly good place to be if you're afraid of the storm. But they tr they trudge outside in the rain. I got to say, the master looks kind of funny in a raincoat. He does. Like Jesus in a puffer coat. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just it just doesn't go well together. But when Chris says, you know, why are we looking outside? Why would he be outside? May says it's his way to be out in the open, which directly contradicts his fear of storms. Exactly. And then a cannonball falls off the roof. It's not a cannonball. It's not a cannonball. It's a stone sphere. At best, it's a stone sphere. When it's sitting on Troy's desk, it doesn't look like stone. It looks like styrofoam to me. Indeed, it does. But some prop person worked very hard. Very hard. And they pretended it was super heavy. It was really heavy. And May feels a regression coming along. Yeah. <laughs> So there's this weird scene. Okay, so Suhami is outside milking goats. Yes. And Chris comes out to talk to her and smooch with her. And he's got the crowbar. He says he finds the crowbar. And he, he says, well, you didn't do it, did you? And then he puts the crowbar in his pocket. Again, is now, that a crowbar in your pocket or are you happy to see me, Tsunami? Not, it's not Tsunami. <laughs> Suhami. <laughs> She's a goat tsunami. And I know I have lady jeans and they have notoriously shallow pockets, but could a dude fit a crowbar in his pocket? Not even that little crowbar. It's over a foot long. Yeah, it's easily. And it's kind of funny because after he sticks it in his pocket and then he goes to hug her, it's like pronging out of the back of his shorts. I'm glad that's what's pronging <laughs> out of the back of his shorts. Um, 
There is some bad acting in this scene. Mm, yeah. They are two young actors. Yeah. And they're, they're learning, learning their chops. Yeah. But uh, I'm sure that both of them feel maybe that scene could have been better. And they, they run across the beavers who are carrying a whole bunch of twigs and stuff. Thatch. Uh, thatch thank you. I was looking for the word. Because they're going to go thatch the new beehives. Or but are, are they? they? Yes. They're out to meet the reporters from the county press. So the beavers are ready to throw everybody under the bus. Well, because they suspect something. They suspect that Bill was murdered. And that the cannonball was meant to kill May. The world's heaviest cannonball. Yes, because now we've had two attempted murders, right? Chris pushes May out of the way when the cannonball falls. I'm just going to call it a cannonball because that's what they call it. Though it's not, we know. And I, I think the beavers are afraid. I think so. So they take the cannonball to the station and Gaius Quintus almost shows up. Yeah. Not now, Gaius Quintus. So May has... I can't even hear Gaius Quintus and not think about May in that stupid Roman getup later. It's just so funny. So May... <laughs> Let's explain okay. that May has a spirit guide. A spirit guide. Who's a food taster. Who's a food taster from 75 AD Rome. Well, not, not Rome. Rome. He's Roman. Yeah. He's Roman in England. Yes. And he says there are dark forces at work. Yeah. And she says that she heard somebody whispering in the master's room the night that Bill died, talking about, you know. Don't why do did, a post mortem. Yeah. Why did you do that? Now, what if they do a post mortem? And, and Gaius Quintus is is coming. So then Troy does a really good May. He does. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> He's got little hand gestures and everything. Yeah, he That's does. a pretty good, pretty good. He uh, does a pretty good impersonation of May. And then like a record scratch, we're in another world. Yeah, we're, we're in, in the, the world of Felicity. No, the Gamlin's guy first. Oh, that's right. Guy Gamlin. He's getting makeup to go on TV. Who is Tsunami's dad. We're, we'll find out. And I'm just going to call her Tsunami now. <laughs> And her mom, who is fantastic. She is the most epic drunk, and then she snorts coke. Her husband is this developer guy. Yeah. He's like rich Extremely and, wealthy. And he actually does a nice thing. He says, I'll give you a ride to our daughter's birthday. Yeah, I'll take you out to the lodge. It may be the only thing that Guy Gamlin does is nice in the whole episode, but... Because he knows she's an epic alcoholic. Yeah. And she probably can't get there on her own. She says, no, I don't want anything from you. And he says, not even my money. And she just throws the phone. <laughs> She's got a pretty nice cordless phone for the moment. And she just flings it across Not the room. Anymore. It's in a bunch of pieces. And then she goes and snorts coke off the top of the piano. And that actress has never snorted cocaine before. Because I wouldn't know. That, that was a pile of snow big enough to kill an elephant. And she, she scrapes it together with like a family photo like frame. Like a family or something. photo frame, yeah. which was nice. <laughs> Guy Gamlin, he's played by an actor named Miles Anderson. Now, Miles Anderson is one of those actors. He always plays the spit part. He's always a little skeezy. Um, he's even in another episode of Midsummer called Last Year's Model, which is a 2006 episode where he's kind of skeezy. Yeah. He's just one of those actors. But when I looked him up to learn more about him, I found out he was born in Rhodesia, which oh. is now Zimbabwe. Yes. And his dad was like a, a government official in Zimbabwe who was pushing for equality and rights for the people of Zimbabwe and then was ousted by a prime minister Ooh. in the 60s. So he, Miles Anderson, still does fundraising and goes back to Zimbabwe and is very political. That's fantastic. So he's like, he always plays the skeezy asshole character, but he's actually a really good guy. You know, my theory is that the people who we see over and over again are the people who do two things. One, they show up, know their lines, and are on top of they're professional. they're professional. And two, they're really easy and nice to work with. Yeah. So no matter what character they play, there's like, oh yeah, we'll get that guy. Yeah. He'll show up, he'll know his lines, and he'll be awesome to work with. Uh, he's also in a campion. What campion is he in? The King's Road. If you guys haven't watched Campion, have we mentioned Campion? No, we haven't you mentioned Campion. You should watch Campion. Campion. It's awesome. Peter Davidson as a... When he's what? 
13 or bon something. Bon vivant <laughs> detective. He's great. And then um, Susan Tracy, who plays Felicity, she's also in Another Midsummer. She's in King's Crystal. Yes, she plays the wife in King's yeah, Crystal. Which is in 2007. Anyway. Who is equally dislikable. My note says, Felicity, so drunk. <laughs> <laughs> When Guy comes to the house, the first person he meets is Trixie. Yep. Who we immediately learn he slept with. Yeah. Like how many got how many people has he slept with that he just randomly runs across these people? I don't know, but they can't even agree on how much they've slept together. He says one night stand. She says four nights actually, and later he says a three night zoological fling. As with the episode, their days are all screwed up also. And she hates him. She does, and him and Craigie meet and and there's like totally a power struggle there. Ian stands up to him. Yep. He wants to go chasing after Tsunami and he says, no, you'll see her at dinner. Yep. Come on. And Felicity stumbles in <laughs> from the road. <laughs> like cross country. Like the cab drops her off where? It looks like relatively near. And then it takes her like half an hour and 20 acres of brambles to get I'm to the house. I'm glad it wasn't raining that night. Yeah. She just falls in while they're getting ready to cut the nut loaf. And she doesn't even recognize <laughs> her own daughter. She thinks Trixie's her she daughter. She goes to Trixie, Sylvie, Sylvie, Sylvie. Oh, and Tim falls out of a tree right in front of Yeah, you. that's right. <laughs> His tree. So the idea is that they're here for Suhami's 18th birthday, and she's getting three million pounds. She's going to inherit her money. Clearly, we're part of the wrong family. Yeah. You can change my name to Tsunami if you want. I'm just, I'm just going to tell you that our children are not going to get three million pounds when they turn 18. No, no. <laughs> So they, they try to have this, this dinner that is all made from their own goods. Yes. Including nut loaf. And strangely formulated bread. Bread that looks like a pile of rocks? But sort of. It's weird. Nut it doesn't loaf. look good. Um, Meat loaf's other brother. But then... Nut loaf. <laughs> <laughs> His loony brother, nut loaf. <laughs> That gives Bat Out of Hell a whole new reason. <laughs> so so they're getting ready. To, they're kind of like trying to tame down dinner. And then May is like, oh, Gaius Quintus is coming. The regression begins. And the regression begins. So they have to go. They all have to go into like the solarium or whatever. Since the pilot, this is the weirdest scene in the show. It is. Since Barnaby's fever dream. But I have to say, before, before we get to May and Gaius Quintus, we have the matching purses. Yes. All of the women of the cult. Tsunami, Trixie, May, all have the same person. We don't but know if Heather has Heather it. Heather never, never has it. Well, because then Ken would have to carry <laughs> one, too. <laughs> and Ken with a little carpet bag with golden stars embroidered on it would be too funny. So they all have these bags, and you got to bring May's into the where the regression That's when is. we find out that at least May and Tsunami have the same bag. Yes. And there is the regression. May... Goes under and pushes a ball out the balls of her feet. The the best part is how many takes did this take? How many times did they giggle and have to stop? Because the only thing funnier than the regression happening is the regression fever dream. Yes. Where May is dressed up like a Roman. It's not a fever dream. It's her as Gaius Quintus, she the is. food taster. Yes. But she it's an an old overweight lady wearing Roman armor. <laughs> And I can only imagine that the scene setters and the production team must have just thought that was so fun. They set up like two tents, a campfire, got a fake pig, and put some armor on that looks like a middle school play, and off they went. And she's great. She is fantastic. She even talks with a man's voice, you know, mush, mush. But the yeah. <laughs> like a husky? Arlo's like Antarctica. <laughs> Arno's so stupid. He loves her so much. No, it, it's mushrooms. And the lights come on and we find... Ian has been stabbed. Ian has been stabbed and he points across the room. Like he's reaching for somebody. Like he's reaching for somebody. Tim's at his feet. He's got a big carving knife. The nut loaf carving knife in his chest. And he, he's a pretty good corpse. Yeah. I gotta they, say. They do a good job. Well, he dies pretty quickly. Yeah, but he's he lays relatively still. He, he's not breathing. No. No. Noticeably. Um, and you're not sure who he points to. No. It could be a number of people. Could be Guy. It could be Chris. Really, those are the two kind of people in that direction. 
So Barnaby and the cops arrive, and this is this is not messing up here. There's no doubt. He's got a pig sticker inside of him. Oh, but he wasn't murdered, Mark. No, he wasn't. He was, was astrally harvested. Yes, <laughs> that's what Heather says. <laughs> What do they call the knife? It's not like a spear of destiny, but something like something that. Something like that. An astral spike or something. Tim has a little bit of blood on him, but not as much. That's because he's hugging the master because he's we, genuinely upset. We find out the master has been hiding. So there's the disguise. Yeah. The wig. The wig. It's a good wig. It is a good wig. It's a convincing wig. Because Ian Craigie has cancer, as we find out And later. he's been going through chemotherapy, so he's he's gone bald. Everybody points fingers at everybody else, so Troy has to spend the night to make sure that everybody is there. He has to sleep on the landing on the floor. This is a manor house. Let's give the beavers a room, okay? Mm -hmm. We'll give Arlo a room and May a room. Arno. Arno. So that's three. Yeah. Tsunami's we'll got a room. Trixie's got a room. That's five. The master's got a room. Bill Six, had a room. Seven. It's not that they don't have a room for Troy. It's that Troy needs to know nobody's leaving. So he has to sleep out by the stairs so they would wake him up if they tried to leave. So the gamblins go to bed together? Is that what happens? In They're there? married. They're married, but they hate each other. Yeah, but he's Felicity. got the booze. Speaking of the gamblins, Felicity asks Guy if he did it. Everybody asks everybody if they did it. Yeah. Speaking of Troy sleeping on the landing, there's yes. a little flub up. We we cannot understand this flub. In that scene, Troy has on the pinky ring that he's had on since Badger's Drift. Yep. But he also has on a wedding ring on his left hand, on his third finger. It's clear as day. It's a band on the right finger. Now... On the correct finger. Okay, maybe the actor's married. No, he wasn't married. He was not so married. So it's not a mistake that he just happened to forget to take his wedding ring off before and, they shot. You know, if we ever got Troy on the show, which would be fantastic, <laughs> that might be the first question I'm asking. <laughs> What's up with the ring, dude? Of all the questions, you wouldn't say, did you want your did hair you parted like that? Did you say goods or goat? Yeah. <laughs> say rot arsed. <laughs> say it for us. Ass um, bandits. <laughs> ass bandits. Red arsed. Um, Barnaby goes home and needs a whiskey. Yeah. Troy thinks I'm a bastard. And, and then then they go, uh, Barnaby shows up at the, at the lodge in the morning, wakes Troy up, and they one of the first people they talk to is Trixie. And Trix, he asks, Barnaby asks Trix, Trixie. Thank you. He questions Trixie. Interrogates her. What? Interrogates her. Okay. <laughs> he says, why do you wear so much makeup? And you've got a cheek. It is probably the rudest question we've heard him ask of anybody. But he claims to notice that she's wearing makeup to cover up some bruises a scar. and a scar. And we know he's a makeup expert from the last episode. Yeah. Because him and Alfreda have been sharing makeup tips. Is that I it? I guess so. Okay. And that's when they get their first taste of, uh, is it acorna? Yeah, I think that's what they call it. They, it's coffee made from ground acorns. Yeah. Well, they don't actually taste it. Well, yeah. Barnaby pours it into the fern when nobody's looking. And Trixie sure loves getting the mail because she gets those blue envelopes. The blue envelope. Ooh. They interview Guy and Tim and Guy are fighting. And then Tim goes up into a tree because he's upset. And Barnaby interviews Guy and Tim uses the force yeah. on <laughs> Guy Gamlin. He's like trying to strangle him from a distance from up in the tree. He's trying so hard and then he... Slaps his hand. And that's probably the first shot where the poor cameraman has to be higher up in that tree than Tim is. Yep, indeed. That cameraman I, I, must I be like 15 think, feet no, in the air. I got to think he was on a crane. On yeah. a, it was on a crane or it was on a scissor lift or something. That they like wedged in the branches. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. Because it's an expensive piece of equipment mm. and you want it steady, mm. unlike the pub shots. <laughs> <laughs> so you want it steady. So you're going to want a solid. He's not going to rush up and be hanging out in that tree with the wind and everything. And a big camera. It's yeah. got to be on a boom right. or on a scissor lift. Gotcha. But still, interesting day on the camera fan field. That's, that's, that's the scene where Guy says they that he and Trixie had a zoological fling. Yes. Which I guess means that they did it like animals. I guess so. I'll say it that way so you don't have to beat me out. And then Felicity announces that she's going to stay. Yes. For on, only for two months. Only for two months. Because she and May are like best friends now. She's going to take a course. 
And Troy has found up some information. First of all, they find out that Ian Craigie has no will. Right. That they can find. Because they they ask May. She says that Arno is the... The admin The person. admin guy. They confront Arno in the greenhouse where the sickest tomato plants ever are getting all this TLC and apparently not benefiting <laughs> from it. Is Arno spraying rat poison on them or something? No. <laughs> or the acorn coffee. Yeah. But he used to be... Um, uh, like a legal clerk. So he was responsible for Ian's will, but he knows that Ian wanted to update it, but he doesn't know what he updated it to. Yeah. And they find out a little bit more about Ian's past, and then Troy finds out about the beavers. Dun, dun, dun. Up in Hull. Yeah. In the north. Which is, you know, a, a shipping lane, right? Yes. Right? It's where the big ships come in and out. Yes. The beavers ran a brothel. And were fined 87,000 pounds. What do you think the brothel was called? The beaver brothel. (laughs) If you have names for the beaver's brothel, please tweet or send them to us. See, I think it should be like beaver and brothel, but with like a sea shanty twist. Don't be so hard on the beavers. No, but like a not ye olde beaver brothel. Leave it to the beavers? No, no, like a like a fisherman twist. Ah. Uh, because, you know, it's for the, the guys coming off the boats. I don't Maybe know. Maybe it's the beaver brothel boat. Maybe it was on a boat. All I know is they had profit sharing. They did. Nobody was pressurized. No one was pressurized. That's what so Ken says. No one was forced to get into a pressurizing chamber. Yes. <laughs> Nobody had the bends. <laughs> From the beaver brothel boat. <laughs> You're not going to tell anybody else, are you? Oh, no, I'm not a gossip. No. Uh, back home at the Barnabys. They, they're having this nice dinner that Kali cooked because it's different, you know. It's good. It's edible, so Joyce didn't cook it. It's they in ha- a different style. They have <laughs> a tiny TV over in the corner. In black and white. No, 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 no. It's in color. Yeah. But it's tiny. It's tiny. It's like 12 inches by 12 inches, which I know TVs it's weren't giant. From 1976. <laughs> but are, were you surprised that the Barnabys have a TV in their dining room? It was weird. It was strange. Because he's going to want to watch the cricket on a better TV than that. Well, no, I just didn't think they were the kind of family who would watch TV in the dining room. Like, if you're going to watch TV and eat, you take it in the living room. And if you go as far as to light candles and, you know, have Cully cook, that's that's a special dinner. Have wine and nice glasses. There are no candles, but they have wine and nice glasses. But it's a good thing that the TV's on. Because... They find out that Chris Wainwright is getting married in the royal style. I don't know who that lady is that he's marrying, but the real Chris Chris Wainwright, the photographer for the So then who is Chris Wainwright? Dun, dun, dun. Besides a guy who's name is hard to say. One of the things Barnaby does at this meal is he sets up the whole death scene. Right. With the bread and the pepper grinder. Yes. And, and, and Cully's like, well, the pepper stabbed the Parmesan. <laughs> no. Which would mean Tim stabbed Ian. Did, but he didn't. Yeah. So they they go to confront Chris. Well, they find the press at the at the house first. Right. But when they confront Chris about his true identity, he's he's with the goats. He's with Tsunami and the goats. And they're sitting in the grass surrounded by goats. And the escapee goat happens. And yeah, before so the goats are all tethered to stakes, assuming I'm assuming that they're tethered that way because that makes them easier to milk. So Tsunami just goes But there's no mention of goat cheese or goat goat's goat. milk or anything. Maybe they put it in the nut loaf maybe as soon as they sit down one goat just gets free and just walks off and nobody nobody notices free is a bird everybody pretends it didn't happen yep but then the whole time they're having this really tense conversation with chris about who he really is who is he's actually bill's nephew. nephew he's sitting on the ground and there are giant goat teats right next to his head the entire giant goat teats. time it's hard to pay attention to maybe i'm sick it's hard to pay attention to what he's saying when right next to his head are these two big swinging goat teeth. <laughs> okay, so to go into Greenland a little bit, nothing you see on camera is by mistake. Right. Right? They framed it up. They Are they saying he's a teat? The director said, make sure you get the teats in there. <laughs> <laughs> So you're telling me that they purposely positioned that goat with the big swinging udder to be right next to his head? I guess. And why else would you do it? I mean, I'm, they weren't paying close enough attention and they were focused on him. I and... believe they're professionals. 
So they purposefully put the goat teats behind his head. There's two scenarios. One in which the goat teats have some special meaning for them. They're calling him a tit. Or two, he did it really well with the goat teats behind him and once. they didn't want to shoot it and again. they didn't want to shoot it again. Well, they already had one goat take off. So maybe they were like, let's just get this. <laughs> I know that director hated those goats. Before all the goats take off. Yeah. And they throw Tim under the bus. Yep. And they go to Craigie's room and they find some documents. They find a new will. Yep. And who is the beneficiary of the new will? So May and Arno are going to inherit everything as long as they agree to maintain the work of the lodge. Barnaby goes and finds Tim, who's up a tree. Mm -hmm. Barnaby at least uses a ladder. Barnaby goes up the tree with the cameraman. Yep. And they have a kind of nice scene here. Barnaby does a good job. He's very kind to Tim. Tim is mute seemingly because of some kind of trauma. Trauma. Or did you get the impression that, like, Tim is autistic? From what I read on the Wikipedia page, in the book, Tim, there's some level of mental retardation. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know. I didn't read the book. It's just from the Wikipedia entry. That's clearly not the case here. He's just traumatized. Yeah, I think the impression we're supposed to get from, just in the show, at least, is that he was traumatized before he arrived at the lodge, and that's why he doesn't speak. So he's not a runner. <laughs> He can run. He just falls down. Apparently. But he, he, can, he can book it pretty fast. Barnaby, he's, he's kind to him. But Ian says that, I'm sorry, Tim says that Ian was killed by magic. And Barnaby's not really sure what that means. The, the but, blade appeared by magic. But it's something. And it's the and first word that Tim has spoken since he came to the lodge. And where is Troy? Troy is off visiting Mrs. Mrs. Cook. Mrs. Cook, who was the first landlady that Ian Craigie stayed with. His name's Crawley. Yeah. Stayed with when he got out of prison. And she has cows. Attack cows, it looks like. Well, they... They attack each other. Yeah. <laughs> They're uh, frisky cows. They're humping away while Troy's trying to not fall into piles of cow poo. He gets in the house and he is rewarded. What's yeah, he rewarded? Mrs. Cook is a cook. She is a cook. Yeah. And she makes is. um prune nibbles and has persuasive cake. Persuasive cake? <laughs> that Troy is just stuffing his gobble. With. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was kind of cute. I the first I remember the first time I saw that scene, I was like, is she trying to put the moves on him via sweets? Like is she No, I think she's just happy to have a visitor. But yeah, I think she's just kind of lonely and she's a good cook. But you, you gotta assume that she, he called head and she prepared the prune nibbles for him. Absolutely. Because she is looking forward to having company. But her cows are not. Well, they're having their own company. Yeah, each other. Arno and May have a nice scene where May asks him if he killed the master. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, It's the the whole subtext of them wanting to be more grown up and become closer together. Yeah. And then Arno asks May if she did it and she freaks out. (laughs) (laughs) It's a great comedy beat. Yeah, it is. It is. It's it's not as good as when the beavers are in the garden tending to the bees. And Ken says, ooh, Heather, honey. And she goes, yes. And he goes, Heather, honey. And she goes, oh, I thought you were being affectionate. Yes. It's just <laughs> a little tiny scene between yeah, them. It's just like a camera pan. But it's so clever. When Troy gets back to the office, Barnaby kind of ribs him about how long he's been gone. And then they find out that they're Guy not, is now dead. Well, they're not charging as much. So Ian, Craigie believed what yeah. he was doing. They're and not Joyce's charged. course would have been considerably less Could expensive. Not 240 pounds. According to the price BAT. list in the pamphlet. Yes. They have so, a lot of offerings. That was a full size eight and a half by 11 with was, three columns oh, on both sides. I would sides. love to see what was on that piece of paper. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know it was just gold. It was just radar stall all the way down the line. <laughs> They, yeah, May calls and says there's another dead body at the lodge. Yeah. <laughs> Guy's dead. He apparently had a heart attack, but he has a, a bottle of pills in his hand. It's an empty bottle of heart pills. So our first assumption is that he had a heart attack and didn't have the medication that he needed, so he died. And Trixie is gone. Absolutely gone. Mm-hmm. But May says somebody who was sending the br- the blue letters is probably where Trixie's at. Yeah, yeah. And May relate to her covering up a scar and bruises. Yep. So this is also when we find out 
that Ian had cancer. And Guy is on a dolly in the morgue because George and Barnaby have a nice little conversation. And Barnaby says, you know, tell me that it was suicide. And he says, no, you know, and George kind of says he didn't have any um, medication in his stomach and he would have had that medication. But Guy's kind of like, he's on a gurney, but it's like a half height gurney. Yeah, it's lower. Like a dolly? Yeah, a little bit. And he's out in the hallway. Yeah, it's weird. It's like they just kind of stuck him out there. It was maybe a busy week. I guess. We've already got two bodies, but one's been cremated already, so. And they've still got Ian in the morgue. He's been there for a while. There's some good dead acting there. Yep. There Ian's some, a better some, dead body in some, the morgue than he is in the chair. He is a better dead body in the morgue. Yeah, so they go to check out... Um, Trixie's boyfriend's house. Raymond, because he's got a return address. So, first of all, we're confused by something. If you're in Britain and you're bonking, do you have to leave the door open? <laughs> because Ray once Patterson again, does. Once again, the door is open. Ray and Trixie do. It's not just that it's unlocked. It is open. Troy says they're at it with the hand symbol. Which, okay, you might think she got there. She leapt into his arms. They rushed upstairs to be together. Now, when they rushed upstairs, did they use the rope banister? They must have. Is the whole theme of the house nautical? But on the way, they stopped to make some chips. They did. Because the chips are still warm in the kitchen. And delicious. And delicious. Yeah. Unless, so, okay. So maybe Ray was making some fries. Making some fries. Because he sent Trixie a letter. Who knows when Trixie's going to show up? You don't know. You don't know. Even if they get the post several times a day, you don't know when she's going to get away. So he's just making some chips. She comes to the door. He goes, ah, takes the chips out of the fryer at the perfect level of doneness. Crispiness. And then they swing on up the rope banister to the bedroom and they forget to close the door. I guess. And they they have a lot of giggling going on. <laughs> they're having fun. They're happy. They're very happy. But Troy says, I think they're doing it. They're at it. They're at it. Yeah. With the hand symbol. <laughs> the fist. <laughs> so we find out that Raymond is actually the one being abused and his 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 ex, now ex wife, ex-wife attacked Trixie. And that's why she had to wear so much makeup. And this is also where we learn that Trixie has a matching purse to May and Tsunami. That has golden thread. Yes. And, and Troy and, no and Barnaby are eating chips the whole time. The whole time. And then Barnaby tells Troy not to eat any more chips. They must be really good chips. Ray Ray says uh, his ex-wife was abusive. And Troy says, well, she, well, she must have been big or something like that. And Ray says she was like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I have only can assume that he used to be married to Vince. Not so, married. Maybe Vince... Because remember, the last episode, the picture of Vince... The, f- the photo fit of Vince looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Simone's ex-boyfriend. So maybe Ray was married to Vince. Maybe. That would explain the divorce. That's quite a crossover. <laughs> it's a, with it's, Arnold in the background going, I had nothing to do with this. It's my little conspiracy theory. Okay. Then they're in the pub. Pub! Now, if we point something out that makes you want to go, huh, I missed that in that scene. I'm going to go pull up that episode and watch that little bit again. This is one of those moments. We've got a two camera shot of Troy and Barnaby having a conversation. We only see one of them at a time, the right? The wonder of Barnaby is perfect. It's fine. But when the camera is on Troy, it's going up and down. It's like the cameraman has had a lot of a corner. Yeah. It's shaking, like to the point where I had to look away because it was almost making me nauseous. Barnaby gets some beer, a a lager. A Guinness and a lager lager. for the two of them. And he sees a guy playing darts and he figures it out. Aha. Aha. He has his moment. They rush off back to To the lodge lodge. to find Arno and May playing keep away with Tim like he's a dog. Who does that? He's 17. Good boy. Good boy. I... He's not a dog. But obviously he loves them. Yeah. Take me through the night of the storm again. He asked the beavers. The beavers say they had to sell everything because of the fine, including their condo in Spain. Costa del Sol. And Arno comes in and we find out the truth about Bill's death. Yeah. And we get a reenactment of Bill falling down the stairs with an 
awesome stunt bill. Yeah, it was an awesome stunt bill. Because if you remember, Bill has a black beard and blonde hair, bad blonde hair. Stunt Bill has quite the wig. Yes, he does. It's it's worth like slowing down because <laughs> he's doing like a backward somersault down the stairs. The wig is fantastic. So we find out that Tim actually caused Bill's death. Yeah, he got he's, scared. He's going to protect the master. Yeah. He was trying to push him away. He wasn't trying to push him down the stairs. Yep. So everybody was kind of covering for him. Arno knew that Tim had done it. I don't know if May knew that, but they've poured um, whiskey on Bill after he fell to kind of give the impression that maybe he was drunk to, to help protect him. Now, there's a scene after this. I don't have it written down, but there must be a scene after this because the thing I have next is there's the fight on the roof with Tim and Chris. Where is Barnaby and Troy before that? It must not have been important. They they pull up yeah. to see Chris and Tim on the roof fighting. Yes. So Chris and Tim are fighting on the roof and it's clear that Chris is trying to kill Tim. Yeah. He's got the crowbar, though Chris claims that he was protecting himself from Tim. Because... Like you do. Exactly. You go up on the roof to confront somebody who then tries to kill you. Tim falls through the window. That's a pretty big effect. And Barnaby to the rescue with the comfy sofa. That's a pretty good stunt effect, you know, that somebody actually went through the window. Yeah, though I'm sure it was safety glass. I'm sure it was sugar glass, yeah. Yeah, but Barnaby is an action hero right there. Barnaby gets everybody out of the way and gets the couch in position. It's almost like, you know, when the firefighters have the big trampoline and they run around so you can jump off the building. (laughs) He's got the sofa. He's like, whoa, he puts it right in the right spot. Chris is very concerned if Tim is okay because we find out Chris is the killer. He's hoping that Tim's dead. Because Chris through the knife that killed the master. Because he used to work in the circus. And Barnaby practices his Spanish and says that he was really good at throwing knives. Yeah, because he's talked to the, the manager of the circus. But who killed Guy? Barnaby thinks it's his daughter. No. But no. It it's was Chris. once again Chris. Because he made the audacity of saying... Give me my pills. Yes. Treated me like a servant. But who are Tim's parents? So Arno comes up to Barnaby at the end and says, you know, I did a lot of lying here and my and trouble here. And what's my charge? And Barnaby says in a nice turn of phrase that all he has to do is raise Tim. Take care of Tim. So May, Arno, and Tim come out pretty good here. Yeah. But where are Tim's parents? I'm Barnaby would be like, no, we need to take him to see his parents. All they needed was one line early on that said, we know who Tim is. He He's an orphan. He, he escaped was, from an orphanage. He was, he was in a bad foster situation. He's much better off here. We'll take care of the paperwork. Like, that's all they had to do. Like two lines. But instead, they leave it as if Tim, this underage kid, appears from nowhere and has no history. And like, whatever the traumatic event was that made him mute, somebody's just going to get away with it. Well, maybe his dad, Darth Vader, had not taught him how to use the force grip yet. (laughs) He's still practicing from the trees. Back at the barn and bees, Cully gets a mail and the mail says... She's going to be a witch. She's going to be a witch. She's off to Perth for three weeks. Three weeks? Three, three months. Three months. Three months. Yeah. Good they, they go out to celebrate because I'm sure Barnaby is the first to suggest they go out yeah, to eat. Yeah, because he doesn't want Joyce to cook. And uh, the press arrive and Barnaby gives them the beavers on a silver platter. Yeah, which... Any good reporter would have known anyway. It's not like they changed their names. No, like, it's pretty simple. They were still using their own names. And that is Death in Disguise, which there is no disguise. There's one bad wig and a couple people going by false names. That's it. It's not really disguise. I I guess you could say that murder is pretending to be suicide or an accident in the case of Guy and Bill, but not really. Not really. I don't know where the title comes from. It's it's a weird title. And that wraps up season one of Midsummer. Season one of Midsummer. So we have the pilot and four episodes of season one. I think we need to do a little recap, don't you? I think we should do a little season review. Let's start with Best Corpse. I gotta go, for Best Corpse, I gotta go 
Agnes in the mo- in the morgue. Why? Because she is rock solid there. Perfectly still. Perfectly still. It's she's in. He opens the drawer and pulls her out, and it's clearly her in the drawer with the door closed. I, I'm gonna go with Max Jennings, written in blood, because oh, yeah, that's he's got good. that kind of capillary stuff going on, and yeah, you sort of see his eye twitch a little bit, but. I don't think I could keep my eyeballs still when somebody no. was prying them open. And he it's definitely Alan looks, Hollingsworth. Definitely looks dead. Yes, he does. All right. How about craziest killer of the season? Craziest killer, I'm gonna have to go with Honoria Lydia. Yeah. She she's, is like and she's she I chose her picture for the the title card of the second episode yeah. because she is bat crazy insane. She's like Normina Bates. <laughs> and for no like And it, Anna Massey's just She's like, just great. We're never really like I had the whole thing about her motive being the last of the Lydiards, but that's not even talked about. Like death of a hollow man, the the crazy guy in that has a better motive than yeah, yeah, because at least he wants his career and his theater back, and he's he's crazy. But but she's just psycho killer crazy. She she's, doesn't even care if she gets caught. She's nuts. How about uh, best Barnaby line? I, I gotta go with the very first line. Oh really? I wouldn't have guessed. When he shows up and it has all the tape and the police car. The crime scene tape. Yeah. I'm going to go with, uh, you're just jealous because I've got a coconut and you, you haven't. Oh, that's a pretty good line. <laughs> How about a uh, dumbest Troy moment? Um, so Troy has had some spectacular moments, bad driving. Mm. Uh, when he loses Alan Hollingsworth and runs around like a chicken in the, the courtyard, yeah. it's not really all that good. But uh, for best Troy screw up, I got to think him leaning against the wall and finding the hidey hole in and Faithful Unto faithful Death. Faithful Unto Death. I'm going to go with the Faithful Unto Death moment too and just go with Rat Arst. Rat Arst. <laughs> How about Worst Joyce Cooking? Uh, I, I got to go back to the pilot once again. Got to go back to Killings of Badger's Drift with the the neck of lamb with mushroom dumplings. Ugh. That just sounds disgusting. I'm sorry. I'm going to go with the, the fish sauce. The lumpy fish it's sauce. It's lumpy, but it's kind of okay. I get it. It's a different style. <laughs> How about best guest star of the season? I, I have to think that the best guest stars of the whole first, the pilot and the first season have to be the Rainbirds. It has to be Richard Kent and Elizabeth Spriggs. They're just fantastic to watch and I never get tired of them on the They're screen. They're so fun. They're so devious, deliciously devious. And they're fun and they're quirky and it's just so weird. We've talked about this, that this is really the first typical Midsummer episode. There's lots of dead bodies, gets to it right away. Death in Disguise yeah. is like the first kind of of what will be a typical Midsummer episode. And we certainly see that in episode one of season two, which is Death's Shadow. You haven't let me say who my best oh, guest star well, who was. Who are your best guest stars? I'm going to go with Anna Massey. She plays Honoria Lydiard. Yeah. Again, not only is she the craziest killer... She's just so perfectly rude. Yes. The whole episode. She just leaves the room. Yeah. She just, you just want to hit her all the time. Yeah. And if it wasn't her, I would have to go with Death of a Hollow Man, his, oh, his wife, who we thought might be his sister, the little old lady. Oh, yes. Donald Pleasant's daughter. Yes. Because she is wonderfully batty. Yeah, she. Yeah, <laughs> she's so great with her stuttering. Yeah. She does such a good job. She does a great job. But but Anna Massey is my pick. Okay. Yeah, we would love to know what your favorite corpse was of season Craziest one. Craziest killer. Craziest killer. Best Barnaby line. Dumbest Troy moment. Worst meal by Joyce. Or your best guest star. Any of those, we would love to hear your thoughts. Leave a comment um, because next time. Season two, episode one, Death Shadow. Mm. One of my favorites. We're getting into some good ones yeah. now. I'm excited. Thanks again for listening. It's so exciting <laughs> to know. Even if only five people were listening, we would be super stoked. 
But as near as we can tell, the first episode was listened to 250 or Some, so. Something like that. It's, it's The it's analytics great. are hard to tell, but way more people than we ever thought would be listening to this or listening to this and recommending it to other people already. And we're just super excited. And thank you so much for listening. It gives us a really good excuse to hole up in our home office away from our teenagers and have an hour or so of fun together in front of my and we're glad that you're along for the ride. Bye, Maniacs. Till next time, bye, Maniacs. Gibbs, the same actor who plays Arno Gibbs, who I can't believe I didn't write down his real name. Wow, I failed on that one. I can look it up for you. Look it up. Arno Gibbs is played by Charles K. Okay, so I'm going to start that again. Yep.